Hello, welcome everybody to this month's Hump Day Hangout. I'm Assistant Chief Terry McGrath, Louisville Fire Department. I'm usually uh, on here and, and uh, co-hosting with Chief Rick Lasky. Chief Lasky is uh, on a on a teaching assignment out spreading the good word somewhere across America. And uh, so we won't be here this week. So you got me. Um, and I appreciate you, uh, everybody joining us and uh, hope that this next hour brings you some good information. I think we've got a great topic to talk about. Um, if you have any questions uh, as we go about the, the show today, you can tweet those uh, using Twitter. You can use the hashtag FE Talk, Fire Engineering Talk, hashtag FE Talk. If you post those up on Twitter, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll do our best to get to them and see if we can answer those questions. Before we get on with the show, um, just a reminder, FDIC is April 20th through the 25th, 2020. You can find information on that, obviously, at FDIC.com. Uh, if you don't know what FDIC is and you're in the fire service, you should definitely talk to someone sitting next to you and and, uh, and experience that once in your lifetime for sure. So April 20, 20th through the 25th, don't wait to register um, as that fills up really fast. Um, today we've got some, uh, some, some pretty interesting and, and great guests to join us. Uh, I've got Chief Scott Thompson with the Colony Fire Department. Chief Thompson's been on here a number of times before. Uh, I've got Chief Victor Conley with Irving Fire Department, and I've got Assistant Chief Brett Stidham with the Dallas Fire Rescue. Sorry, uh, Chief Stidham, I just call it Dallas Fire Department, but uh, anyway. You're good. Uh, we're going to talk, uh, as we had posted, our, our topic today is about blocking engines. So um, before we jump into that, Scott, I did want to say that, uh, you know, our, our prayers and thoughts are with the, uh, the Colony Police Department. I know you had a... a uh, a uh, officer die there. I guess that last week, right? Yes, that's uh, correct. Yeah. So uh, anyway, um, uh, uh, unfortunate uh, incident there, and, uh, and our hearts and thoughts and prayers go out to you and, and your uh, your whole city over there. And thank y'all, all of you that chipped in and helped us through that time. We greatly appreciate it. Um, so we're talking about highway highway management uh, and and the utilization of blocking engines and. And uh, at least in this Metroplex, uh, I think Irving was probably the first out the door on this uh, and probably uh, one of the best ideas that I, I think that I've seen in a long time. Uh, and especially since it didn't really involve um, uh, uh, hiring a lot of personnel and going out and buying a, a million and a half dollars worth of equipment. In actuality, we're kind of uh, adding to our sustainability theme and and uh, and trying to to utilize something old for something new and and uh, so anyway, um, this is this is something that the city of Louisville we're actually trying to do that. We've got two new engines after today's show. I'm jumping on a plane and going to Appleton to do a final on two engines up there. And when we get those in, we're trying to move something off the back end. And we've put some uh, budget package together this year. And it's a conversation we'll have next week with the city manager to try to put a little bit of funds into an older engine and, and utilize this um, asset out there. Because I, I, I tell you and I, and I know and, and we're going to hear from Chief Conley and Chief Stidham in a minute about the real life of, of, uh, of what's going on out there on the highways if you haven't experienced that yourself. But, you know, every time our guys are out there on the highway, you know, if it's two of our engines, I got one point two million dollars worth of resources out there. And if it's one of our trucks, I got one point three million. And more importantly, I can't do without them. So um, no one argues the necessity of what we're doing and why we're doing it. But I do believe that uh, this blocker uh, using a blocker equipment, designated equipment for this is, is definitely the better way to go. So with all that being said, uh, Chief Conley, I wanted to start with you because um, you all in Irving had an incident. Uh, was it in 2015? You had a truck hit out on the highway. I was wondering if you could just kind of uh, tell us a little bit about July, what happened. July 2015. You're kind of here. Hang on. That's yeah. Right. Uh, Go to try for some reason. All right. Well, he's working on that. So, uh, Chief Stidham, let me jump over to you because in a recent article, and I read this, this is actually what I used to push this forward to city management. I went to uh, Chief Tittle with it 
but one of the statistics that I read in a, in a recent news article uh, that I had forwarded on, and, and you can verify that this was accurate, that it said since 2016, you've had 70 apparatus hit on the freeway. Is that accurate? That is accurate. We've actually, we're up to about 77 right now. So um, yeah, since 2016. And we've just in 2018 alone, we made over 16,000 calls on the freeways. And so, you know, for us, it was just a, it was a matter of uh, not only keeping our members safe by doing this program, but also to keep our apparatus on the road. Our frontline apparatus were just, you know, getting hit like I said, 77 times in just a few years. So it's, I think the program for us has been a hit. It's been a success so far. Okay. And in those, in those instances, do you guys go in there? Is there a, is there any kind of a breakdown? Not that you, you need to, but just out of curiosity, as far as what's happening after hours or during the day, is it, is, uh, is the majority of your accidents, the, the late at night ones? Uh, for us in Dallas, it is, yeah. So we looked at it across the board Monday to Friday, uh, basically 7 in the morning to 7 p.m. and 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. And the probably two-thirds of the times we were getting hit was from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. after hours. So obviously, higher speed traffic, things, you know, not as many people on the road and, uh, you know, just a lot of uh, bad curves and, whatever else in the city and just leads to more accidents at nighttime. And so prior to you guys implementing this program uh, back in the old days, if you will, your highway response consisted of a rescue, which for y'all is a, is a medic. And then two engines or engine truck. Is that what you guys were doing? So we run engine truck uh, generally. Now, if a truck is going to take over a certain amount of time, an engine will respond and the truck will get there when it gets there. So we generally try to have, you know, obviously the engine there for medical care and uh, and or any sort of fire, you know, related incident or whatever. We try to get them close to the scene and then have something to block. So generally it's an engine and truck, but it could be two engines in a truck depending on the situation. Okay. Um, Chief Connolly, you there? Let's try that again. Let's try it again. Can you hear yeah, me? That sounds good. So jump back to your okay. incident. Well, our incident happened back in July of 2015. Uh, just to give you a little background, I was at the National Fire Academy when it took place, second year. And uh, we had a ladder truck that was called out to block for IPD who had an abandoned vehicle from a, a drunk driver. And we sat out there on the way, about two hours waiting on the record service. They showed up with the wrong record. Of, Moved the vehicle, and right after they left, we had an 18-wheeler going about 70 miles an hour in that lap. Spun it 180 degrees and rolled in a 360. Threw my three firefighters, two to the service road, and the officer down the highway. Should have all been dead for all practical purposes. But uh, once that was over, an hour later, another drunk driver hit a cop car that was blocking for our ladder truck that had been hit. So and all this happened on 182. And my original paper focused around trying to follow a model up in Wisconsin where they charged the Department of Transportation after six months if the driver at fault did not pay for the services that were provided on this uh, state highway. Uh, after talking to Chris Keneally and some other people with the Texas Fire Chiefs, there was not going to be any support to do that. The hill was too conservative to do anything like that, so I started looking for resources that were at my fingertips. And that's when I came up with the idea of using, repurposing these apparatus that we were auctioning off for about $3,500 a piece. So that's kind of where the idea all started at. There's a lot of good benefits with the program. It's kind of mutated over the last years. And and after about a year and a half, believe it or not, to sell it to my boss to get the support to get these pieces of equipment put out on the highway. But since that time, each one of our ladder trucks, we have five here in Irving, uh, have a blocker tied to them. And anytime there's a wreck on the highway, they respond with the blocker. Anytime there's a wreck on one of our inner streets, major thoroughfare, thoroughfares, they can request a blocker. And anytime IPD is doing an investigation on a highway, they can request one out there to block. So we also use it to staff with 
people on modified duty or workers comp uh, to separate it from the ladder truck when we can. But uh, it's been successful. We've had, you know, from the inception, we've, we've been hit a few times. It was in March. We had one of our blockers totaled uh, by a young lady coming coming home in the early morning, I think it was six o'clock in the morning, hit that blocker, slid it 15 feet sideways and totaled it, bent the frame. Uh, but there were, there were about eight police officers doing an investigation just on the other side that she would have plowed right through. I mean, she went through cones, she went through flares, and then she hit our lit blocking apparatus. And so it wouldn't have slowed her down. She was traveling at a high rate of speed in a, uh, I believe it was a Chrysler 300. So. That's just a little bit about the program. We, I've been sending this stuff out. I've been, and stop me wherever you want me to shut up because I can talk about this program a lot. Um, but uh, I've been up to Pennsylvania and worked with the Emergency Responder Safety Institute under the USFA. Um, they wrote a white paper on it. I uh, hear the NFPA's got it, and, and I'm kind of, I'm kind of wondering what they're going to do with it. I hope they don't put a lot of regulations because that's the whole concept is to use the resources you have available at your fingertips. I didn't want to rely on the water department. I didn't want to rely on sanitation to try to get an apparatus. I wanted to use mine. It's at my fingertip. I changed the graphics. I put about $3,500 into putting a, a blocker into service. And uh, it's been, uh, like I said, it's been good for our department. Our personnel have it. At first, they were like, what are we doing here? And then after we had a couple of them hit and they got to stay on their brand new tillers, they were like, okay, we like this idea. So, so, and, and just, to, I want to put this kind of into context for, uh, because you, you've got, you know, both of these to me with, with Dallas fire with Irving is some interesting numbers that go along with this. And I mentioned the 70 accidents that Dallas has, has experienced, but you know, in the, in the city of Irving in this same news article, was ref how many how many uh you, you said five ladder trucks how many engines you have front line we have 12 okay so 12 engines five ladder trucks and in a five-year time period nine of them hit two of them totaled that cost two million dollars and then separate from that 1.5 million in repairs that's accurate no that's not accurate it was just shy of two million for the repairs the replacement and injuries total that was a total cost. So that's just, for, yeah. for everything. Well, obviously a, a, a staggering cost, but you said one of those, one of your blockers has been totaled already. Yeah, back March of this year, it okay. got total. Got total. Okay, so certainly that number goes. And and you know, I don't want to, I don't want to seem uh, callous or insensitive to the human factor here, because, but fortunately, because of this program, we're not talking about the human factor. Uh, in, in terms of how tragic uh, all of this would be. Scott, um, so you're in the same boat, I think, that I am. You're probably farther along than we are, but you're, a, a, like us, a smaller department than Dallas and Irving, and, and this is something you're putting your, not just your toe in the water. You guys are, are all in on this, right? You guys are rolling this out? Yeah, we, uh, we had a vehicle hit last year, almost hit one of our guys, but it was about $120,000 of damage, minor compared to what Victor talked about. But, you know, I love when people say we're too small to do things like that. So that was just the challenge. But we had a, one of the rear steer quints um, go out of service, and they were going to give us about $18,000 for it. And I went to my boss. It was very easy. I said, hey, look, at Irving's doing this. Dallas is doing this. Showed him the statistics, and it was really that quick. Uh, we got about 3000 bucks. Uh, to put into it, we're decommissioning the ladder and the pump, and um, we're opening station four, which our truck and our rescue be down there. So stat, it's right off the highway. So we're, uh, you know, we're running a five-person truck, and one of those guys will drop off and uh, bring the block vehicle. And so we're just now finishing up on it, and it'll uh, it'll go in service when station four opens. But I, man, I think it's a brilliant idea. Um, it's a shame, though, we have to have to write papers and have studies and, and do all those things to get this. I mean, it, it's a pretty low cost program, um, you know, yep. and I think every every department should at least talk about it. And uh, probably the greatest challenge, and I'm sure Dallas and, and Irving both, is, you know, is, is how you staff it. But once you get past that, man, to me, it seems like a no brainer. Well, so let's let's talk about that because that that seems to be and as we're again, you know, we're we're on the uh, we're on the beginning phase of, of trying to do this. And that seems to be the the top topic of conversation is how how are we going to do this? So, you know, of course, in, in 
and and I spend the majority of my life in a in a uh, depressing office, uh, <laughs> looking at computer screens and 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 you know getting excited about numbers and things like that. But so not all of my ideas translate to uh, to uh, something that that breeds success out in the field. But so we're trying to figure out exactly best best way to do this. So let me kind of go around the horn. Scott, you mentioned how the colony's looking at, at staffing or how you're deploying the resource. Um, Chief Stidham, I, I had read that you guys actually, uh, are your blockers, are you staffing them with a person assigned to that, uh, that asset? We are. So, you know, we have 22 ladder trucks um, and we'll have 23 this fall so that it's a challenge for when we got so many freeways within the city, um, it was a challenge on how to staff. So uh, I actually had, and I, I'd be remiss if I didn't recognize Deputy Chief Chris Wilford and Battalion Chief Al Hoggett and Battalion Chief Jeff Brinker for really working on our program, working with Irving and uh, Chief Conley's group over there to, to kind of get us to where we're at. But currently what we have is we have two blockers um, and we have them basically tied to two freeways within the city. Uh, one of those freeways out of the 77 some odd accidents we've had has had probably two thirds of those uh, just on one stretch of freeway because of curves and hills and so forth. And so um, we tied one of the engines to that area. So we're currently doing it through overtime uh, which is obviously not the best way to do it. So we're looking at some other avenues right now. Uh, I'm looking at actually trying to fund positions to staff it to that way they can roam freeways uh, and help other companies. But for us, um, it would be a challenge to have 22 of them because of all the accidents we've had. Um, you know, we don't have that many backup pieces of equipment to, to put them on. So just finding enough pieces of equipment that were slated for auction to actually get the program up and running was a challenge. But uh, we're looking at some changes in the future. We're kind of gathering information right now to make the program better. But like Chief Conley said, our, our members love it. They feel safer because of it. And again, uh, they get to stay on their frontline equipment uh, when something happens to one of the blockers, so. And so the way you're deploying those, uh with two, so let's <clears throat> play and let's, so you're out by Mesquite far out east on 30. Are you still getting your rescue engine truck? Then the blocker comes once the blocker's in place that frees up the truck, is that how it works? Yeah, so like I said, we've kind of tied them to two freeways. So eastbound, westbound 30, east of downtown, anywhere in that area, if a wreck happens, We've got basically probably four or five ladder trucks that answer that area, depending on who's in, you know, who's in service, who's on runs at the time. Uh, so if any accidents happen either direction, the blocker will go and assist. And we deploy them code one. Uh, and we did that only because obviously the safety factor of, of responding code one, but also to give the apparatus a chance to get out there, find the accident, uh, the officer can make notification to the blocker, hey, here's where we're at, here's where you're needed, as opposed to everybody chasing everybody around the freeway. We just felt like that was best for us. Okay, and then, so Chief Conley and you guys were, you guys were kind of the tip of the spear on this thing, certainly in this area of the country, but um, how, how do you guys deploy and or staff and, and how does the asset work? Well, before I get into that, I just want to say kudos to you guys for even looking at it. It's very humbling that an idea would, would you know, take a hold in the fire service like it has. Um, one thing I, I tell, and like Scott with his community, may not be as big as Irving, certainly not the size of Dallas, but, you know, 12% of our firefighters died, line of duty death. 12% died last year from being hit by a vehicle you know, second only to cardiac events on the fire ground as far as statistical data that's kept, not counting our cancer and our PSI or PTS and the uh, over a thousand injuries. So we got it. We, we got to do something. And, and I, I respect each one of y'all for looking at the program and implementing it the way that it fits in your community. And that's what I tell. I've had departments from Washington to Canada to Florida ask for what did we do? How did we do it? How did we sell it? And I share all that information 
But I always tell them, make it work for your community, whatever it is. Use your resources and make it work for you. Now, in earning the way we do it, I've got it tied to each one of my ladder trucks. My firefighter, when they get dispatched to block on the highway, follows the ladder truck in the blocking apparatus. Now, if for some reason, like blocker eight, one of our five was totaled in March, I rotate my oldest backup pumper into blocker status as long as I have enough backup pumpers in place so if a front line goes down I hope that makes sense but uh, the way we deploy it was you we use the firefighter on both the tillers and the ladder trucks to drive the blocking apparatus when they arrive on scene they set the blocker the ladder gets in the shadow the driver of the blocker leaves the blocker, gets on the ladder truck until that company is ready to clear and they take them both with them. Now then, if we left it out on scene for PD and investigate another incident, so they call another ladder company to bring a blocker. We respond, code one, set the blocker up, leave it with that ladder company, return that company back into service, and when they clear the scene, they return the blocker back to its, its station of destination. So uh, all that has worked well for us. We've got not near the highways of Dallas, but we've got about 30-plus highway miles in Irving, and we've got three of the top 100 most congested highways. And with all the construction that's going on in the Metroplex, it doesn't matter if you've got one mile of highway. You need to be looking at something to protect your frontline apparatus and your personnel. So... That's how we deploy it here in Irving. Gotcha, cutting out there. So, um, Scott, you mentioned that for y'all in the colony, so you're going to put this at a station. You've got a ladder truck. You run that. Uh, you're running a two-man squad, and that's a, a concept of a of kind of a lightweight fast response type of, of, of utility vehicle for EMS calls, things like that. You're taking the load off of the truck, basically, but you, that's where that blocker will go. And so what are you going to do? Once you deploy it, do you stay with it, or, or is it a, a, an idea where you would drop it and then retrieve it? Or Well, we don't have, you know, we only have about three miles of highway, and, and that's something that we're talking about right now. The plan as it stands uh, right now, we want to keep our one and only truck uh, somewhat available. And like I said, those five people combined to make up that truck company, even though two of them are on that, that quick response vehicle. So right now uh, on an accident, uh, we would do a lot like what Victor's saying. We would send the truck with the blocking unit, one person on that, that unit, and uh, they would get out of that vehicle and go to the truck or go to work with the truck. Uh, to be honest, we haven't talked about situations where we go leave it. We, we haven't thought about that. I, I need to give you, Victor, and get your policy. But uh, you know, we want to get them out of there and put it out just as having mass between them and the rest of the people. And then when it clears up, uh, that firefighter will get back in that, that truck and, and take it back. And that's how, how we'll kind of deploy. But we haven't really talked about leaving it yet. We just want to get it out where that we, we get that firefighter teamed up with the rest of the truck crew and they go to work doing whatever they're doing. So, well, I got you here. So I want to go back to when you said you, you went and pitched this to your city manager. So um, your, your city manager, um, uh, I think he's a lot of fun. He's a, yeah. he's a pretty high speed guy. Uh, so obviously you had a, a, an apparatus hit on the highway. So you can go in there with, uh, with something tangible to put in front of him and say, hey, so this is real and this happened. And, and obviously... 125,000 is nothing to sneeze at. Certainly uh, a death or a, an injury is, uh, is, is that tenfold. Um, so no pushback, no, no absolute buy-in from, uh, from city management on that. No, and, and actually I did it in an email. I took all the statistics I could get from Dallas and Irving and other things. And, and the incident we just had, I summarized it. We were, uh, we were going to trade in our vehicle. It wasn't going to auction. We had it as a trade-in on these new pumpers. And like I said, it was under $20,000. And um, my boss is very pro-employee and, and protecting them. And I shot him the thing. And it, <laughs> by the end of the day, he sent me back and said, hey, do it. You know, how much money is it going to cost to get you um, 
get you up to where you need to be. And I identified some, some money we had to do that. And he said, man, do it. So, but we're only, we only got one. We don't, we don't have multiple ones. Um, we were trying to find a good use for those quints and I think we found it. So, uh, it, mine was, mine was pretty painless and we just put the policy together and we're getting ready to go with it. So it, mine was pretty uneventful. Kudos to you, Scott. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate you guys for giving me the info to, to support it. But you know, th this is one of those things I think you can talk it to death. And while we're doing that, our guys are exposed on the highway. I mean, there's no argument against it really, if you look at right. it and, and you know, in the fire service, sometimes we get so wrapped up with committees and, and all this other stuff and, Man, call you, get the policy, see what you can do in your jurisdiction. Like you say, it's got to be local. It's got to be personal. Pull the trigger and do it, man. Yep. Yeah. So I uh, and 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 again, when I sent uh, when I sent my information, and then we had that that kind of follow up conversation, and and uh, you know, I it's it's one of those moves, kind of like I said at the beginning of the show, that uh, you know, there I think there's very few things that come forward that or you want to you want to get invested in uh within in any fire emergency services that doesn't have an enormous price tag that comes along with it and to me this uh this is absolutely a no-brainer um i've even so i i just in the interest of discussion because i kind of have uh and, and in the interest of full disclosure i worked for uh, a few years as a police officer i worked in dallas so uh I, I've been out there as a police officer on the highway, and, and I guess where I get frustrated right now, and I go back to a comment that Chief David Brown made after the, uh, the tragic shootings in Dallas where the, uh, all the officers were shot a couple of years ago, when he made a, a comment about we're being asked to do too much, and, and his reference was law enforcement having to deal with mental health crisis and there wasn't enough resources, so kind of the the fallback solution for all of that was you go back to law enforcement and they basically have to handle it one way or the other, they're going to handle it. And, and sometimes I look at this issue of the highway, I look at it and it frustrates me because that's kind of why I, f I feel like we are in that situation now. And, and I don't want that to come off the wrong way in that I'm, I'm saying that we shouldn't be providing protection for everyone that's out there because we should and it naturally falls back to us because we have the biggest stuff out there but i also feel like uh there needs to be some more focus and attention from law enforcement i mean traffic management is a law enforcement thing and that's what we're talking about here today but also you know the 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 majority of highway that comes through Louisville. Well, no, I say, let me take that back. A hundred percent of that highway that's coming through Louisville, at least a portion of that highway is tolled. And so we're racking up a lot of revenue from the tolls. Uh, we're racking up, well, we're not racking up revenue. Revenue is being made. And, and I understand that, you know, everything has a cost and highway maintenance is expensive. So I get all that. I guess my point in all this is that we have assumed this responsibility because it had to be done. And I have no issue there. But I can remember, and Scott, I think you were here as our training chief when this whole initiative came around. You remember when this big push to send to everybody this highway traffic management, blah, blah, blah. And there was a huge, we had to get everybody down there and, and, and everyone had to go through this to learn that you need to clear that highway as fast as possible, get out there. And, and so I sit here and I look at these two things and I think, you know, as much as energy and effort and and uh attention that was paid to getting through everybody into this traffic management course for the purposes that that were laid out at that point in, in time but i don't feel like collectively we're talking enough with partners i.e police i.e the the toll authorities uh certainly the state of texas those sort of things that we we have to come up with a better plan uh which which may lessen the burden of, of fire departments trying to trying to get into this world. And I didn't know what you guys thoughts were on that. Let so me I, jump in here right quick. If I can, um, can y'all hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. When I was putting all this together, I actually put out a policy that we would con department of transportation or the national tollway authorities to come out and block when we arrived out on scene. So when I received the call, I had our dispatch center automatically call these people, these other entities to come out and help block. 90% of the time they never showed up. 
okay? So that was part of my data to get the program off the ground. They did not support it in any way. They, I could not, they got to where they didn't even answer the phone, much less than anybody out there. So I don't know what we do to get them involved. These are state highways. We're using our local resources. And the, and the smart people down in Austin are capping us on our revenue on what we can do locally. You know, so it's, it's very frustrating on what's going on. So we've looked at that. And something else I want to throw out is we worked when we did our contract with our record provider here in Irving. We put a time stamp on them for 20 minutes. We wanted you on scene in 20 minutes. The other aspect is get the cars, unless it's part of an investigation with PD, get them off the highway, relocate them in a parking lot, and then haul them off one at a time. All that was built into the contract when we set it up with a local record company that responds to all of our incidents. So that's just some more breadcrumbs. If y'all want to pick it up, great, and use it in your jurisdiction. But those are things we looked at as well. So I'll talk. Um, I, I have been working with the Tollway Authority also. We've had initial meetings anyway on, on ways they can help us. And I, I feel I feel Chief Conley's pain that uh, sometimes it can be a challenge. But I will say that uh, most of our accidents here in the city of Dallas are not answered by DPD. They're answered by the Dallas Sheriff's Office. Mm -hmm. And so I've had, uh, we've started meet, I've started meeting with them about every six months to discuss freeway accidents and, and how they can help us and knowing that it's state law and clearing the freeways and all that kind of stuff. And, and from, from our standpoint, anyway, we're pretty fortunate in that the Dallas Sheriff's Office does a really good job of, of getting on scene quickly and trying to help. Um, one of the things they've talked to us about, and one of the things they're looking at is a clearance vehicle, like a, a large high profile vehicle where they just run somebody 24 hours and just to push cars off the road uh, where there aren't any kind of, you know, big investigations that need to take place or whatever. So we are having those conversations um you know with with 22 trucks and all these runs were made i can't if i had six blockers out there full time i couldn't cover all the accidents that are on the freeways in the city of dallas so um we're looking at any and all partners to try to help us uh with the challenges that we have but uh like i said we we are having those conversations terry um and Victor, you hit it early on. The thing I, I like about it is we have total control over it. It's kind of like our rapid intervention team. You know, we, we know when they're getting out there, we can communicate with them and uh, we can place them and use them. And I, and I think that's pretty important. I can't think of another agency and our law enforcement does great, but they're not really responsible for the tollways. But there's not anybody else set up to really get out there as quick as we can and uh, and and fit in and, and coordinate with us. So personally, uh, I'm, I'm looking to, to really grow this within the organization. I would love to some point be able to get staffing and, and, and whatever, but I just think personally, it's something that we need to have total control over. Again, we're the small guys and it's a little bit easier, but um, I, I feel pretty strongly about that. Yeah, and I guess where it, it becomes particularly challenged was I, was I was interested in that Dallas Fire is able to staff this with people dedicated to that. Whereas, you know, in Louisville, we're not. So Louisville, our model, uh, you know, we've, we're, we're looking at two, two different ideas. I've got, I've got a fire station that's on the north border, the south border, and luckily one of them's on the east side of the highway, one of them's on the west side of the highway. Uh, so, you know, it was natural to me to think that, well, if I deployed two of them, I could, you know, anything northbound comes out of this station, anything southbound comes out of this station. Um, but until we get to that point, until we kind of figure all this out, you know, our, our fallback, I think, is going to be, that uh, a blocker would naturally go to the centermost station, which is where we're running one of our ladder trucks. Um, we have minimum staffing on our trucks of five, so we have a person we can throw in that, and then you know figure out whether we, uh, you know, we we send the ladder truck out with the blocker, retrieve the person, the engine brings it back, and so all those sort of things. That's what we're looking at. Uh, for me, those are going to be easier to. Uh, easier to navigate. Uh, right now, I just need the, the stamp of approval from City Hall to say we can move forward with doing this. And then uh, once I once I can get my hands on the asset and that's, uh, that's uh, you know, to, to, to get it where we need to be it. So, so with all that being said, and, and to your point, Scott, I guess what frustrates me is that 
this this is a bit of a staffing issue in that you know we we're very uh, fortunate that, that that our city leaders agreed with us and put five man staffing on that truck and that's holy to us and i think it would be to anyone in this in this line of work what frustrates me is is that sometimes when something comes up in order to solve a problem that's kind of the first place we lean because i have an extra body there or a couple of extra bodies well yeah i do except for when i need them and when i need them it's pretty damn important so that's where the true challenge comes and i don't i don't and i, I just want to clarify i'm not advocating that that we're stuck in a position and we shouldn't be and we do this begrudgingly what i really want is like like chief stidham was was talking about is i want some more conversation and i want some idea that either either the ability to to get some funding in order to support what we're doing um and, and not just like well make it fit within your budget or uh you know cut another program to implement this program um because you know like all of us we're all providing uh, a, a number of different services and they're all pretty darn valuable especially when you got to have them so uh, it's challenging and i'm not complaining either to city leaders uh that's that's part of the that's part of the uh the fun of these jobs is that uh you know you've got to you got to figure things out but it just seems like uh and, and honestly maybe we're just in the in the uh the infant stages of this because uh, you know i think uh irving getting into this and of course on the outside, we look at the stories and, and I'm sitting up here thinking, honestly, in my mind, it's a matter of time, it's going to happen. And and I'm trying to hustle to get something out there because if and when that happens, I want it to be a, an old, you know, 18 year old engine and not a four year old engine, but um, you know, with, with, with all that being said. So let's talk a little bit about, and, and Chief Conley, uh, let's start with you. What did you do to the equipment? How did you make it? Well, how did it go from, I know you mentioned you, you throw a reserve in there sometimes, but a true blocking engine that you've dedicated for that purpose, that purpose only, what'd you do to it? Well, basically, of course, we decommissioned it. We stripped the engine of all of equipment. And what we loaded back on it was our kitty litter for our oil sorb, shovels, brooms, flares, cones. Uh, we don't worry about the maintenance of the air conditioning uh, we just keep it maintained mechanically to run up and down the street, low cost. Uh, and then we went back and pulled the graphics off that identified it as an engine company and made it a traffic incident management response vehicle. So we changed the graphics and we put aero boards on it. The aero boards on the back side are taped with the stop sign reflective red. And it's got the LED lights where the operator, when they set the apparatus, they turn the directional arrow on and it, it's on three sides, both rear and the very back. And it just directs the traffic around where you're at. Another idea that's been thrown out there is to turn your spotlight on in the evening and just shine it in the lane to keep, for some reason, people, when they're driving a car, when they see a spotlight on the road, they think there's something there. So they slow down and they go around it. So, that's just another technique that you can impl implement at night. But the equipment was minimal. We spent about $3,500, uh, and we stripped the apparatus of all equipment except what was needed for an incident on the highway. So it was, it was very minimal. We can, we're currently looking at the, and forgive me, for, I don't know the term, but the, the filler and diapers where you add water and it swells up. And I know Dallas is putting sand and we looked at that, but our tanks are baffled and we didn't want to have to cut them in half. So we're looking at this gel that we can add into the tank, add water, and it holds it in there and adds weight, but it can be flushed when you get ready to auction it off. Or I'm even looking at, and we've already done it once, but uh, donating it through the Helping Hands program of the Texas Forestry Service to volunteer departments. There's some volunteer departments out there that do stuff on the highways as well. And we're looking at donating some of these blocker apparatus through that program, through the Helping Hands program. So anyway, bottom line, about $3,500 worth of equipment to put it out on the highway. Something else we hadn't talked about in Irving, we talked about the cost. We talked about protecting the, the manpower out there working first responders. But days out of service, 
you know, we talked about originally for five years, I had nine pieces of equipment hit, two were totaled. Those other seven were out over 2,000 days combined, being repaired on. I recently had a truck hit. I, I hate to say this, but I'm going to share it with you guys. We had a brand new truck in our yard and another department, sanitation, solid waste, ran into it in the yard and caused severe damage. So now I'm like, I tell my, my boss, I said, do I need a blocker in the city yard now to keep you from hitting my equipment for crying out loud? But anyway, the, just keep the cost minimal, protect your people and protect your frontline equipment. I think your program will be successful. And, and Chief Stidham, uh, I'm, I'm assuming, I think, I think probably the, the, the answers are all the same because I think we're kind of following Irving's lead on this. But as far as uh, the equipment, once you, you put it into that status, what, uh, what major alterations are you guys doing? So, yeah, ours are very similar to what Chief Conley was talking about. Uh, our folks actually went over and visited Irving and uh, I'd say borrowed, but we're not giving them back. So we actually stole those ideas from, from Chief Conley and his folks. And, uh, I mean, they were so gracious in, in everything they did for us. But, yeah, we put the same aero boards. Uh, I think we spent a total of between five and $6,000 for two of the apparatus. Uh, we, you know, $2,500 a piece, whatever it is. Um, but like Chief said, we, we do add sand into the tanks. So we stripped all the hose, uh, made sure they were roadworthy. Uh, we did add some, uh, you know, cones and stuff like that, but we're not asking the folks to get out of the apparatus and put cones on the freeway. They're doing their job just by having the sign boards on them. So we have an arrow board on the back that shot that arrows in both directions and then one on either side, just like Irving does, change the name of it to traffic, traffic incident management. And then took the water out and added 6,000 pounds of sand. And, nice. and I don't know that I mentioned it earlier. I don't remember if I did or not, but Within a week of our program starting April 1st of this year, on April 8th, we had a brand new, I think it had only been on the road maybe three days, a brand new Pierce uh, tower ladder, 1.35, you know, $1.4 million, whatever it was, close to that amount. Uh, the blocker was blocking, uh, released the truck. So when the truck's not needed, we go ahead and release the truck from the scene. Uh, it was raining. Uh, car come in about 30, 40 miles an hour and hit the blocker within a week. So, uh, you know, brand new truck sitting out there, no telling what kind of damage would have been done, how long it would have been out of service and so forth. But the blocker took the hit and it's still on the road. So we're good. And then Scott, you mentioned on your, uh, I know that's that rear steer, uh, but, but similar, similar setup. That's what you guys are moving moving forward with yeah we're going to add a little more we're going to add some barricades and stuff like that just you know when we have other incidents around town and we have to call public works after hours for we're just going to put them on there and that'll be a resource that pd can also use if you know say we have a gas leak or or, or something in town that's not necessary we can we can come out and have the barricades with us instead of waiting for that hour and hour and a half but but, but we got a quick we got a lot of room on it um we're, we're trying to figure out how to utilize that ladder being a little higher up to mark it and uh you know get the the arrow sign wherever it is we're talking with um uh you know some of the transportation departments on there some of their lighting schemes and so forth so we're going to do a little bit more but basically yeah the same thing some absorbent cones and took everything off of it and and those so yeah pretty much the same um just and i there's some roads i hate to go down but but you know, I guess you gotta gotta pull back the band-aid sometimes. So we've we've touched on the the obviously the the intent of this program and it's and it it would be it would be insane in my opinion to stand up and in any way say that it's not a great program. Uh, but the 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 getting down to the personnel, so was there immediate buy-in from personnel and, and specifically in, in Chief Conley when you started rolling this out because, and invariably, because someone picked up some more responsibility. And now, and, and of course, you know, it's, it's, it's like the RIT team because everybody shows up and doesn't want to be RIT because they want to be in on the action. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's truly 
probably the most important asset in, in my opinion that you have sitting out there and they better they better come ready and 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 ready to, to go to work but but voluntarily nobody's looking to uh to jump on that uh that assignment and so in this particular case and then and chief Stidham, i want to go to you too because i'm just thinking in my head man my day is a is to go and 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 i'm driving that blocker apparatus and then and you know i uh, the 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 idea of you know I, I guess i put it in context of trying to explain this to my parents like my job for 24 hours that day was to drive a piece of equipment that we hope gets hit so nothing else gets hit we don't want anything to get hit but you know that sort of thing so personnel wise when you roll this out uh and uh, and and because there's going to be a, a small minority of people out there that just frustrated because they don't want to be the one to deliver it. They don't want to get up at night or you know whatever the case may be. So, so what uh, what was your experience there? Well, I think we can all agree firefighters don't like to see change and they don't like to see things stay the same. So, at first we got some pushback. You know they're like why do we have to have a blocker but uh you know the way we rolled it out in irving is tied to a ladder truck so if you're not responding to a blocking incident on the highway they may go to a all day long but when you respond to a blocking incident the firefighter drives it out there but i will say once they started getting hit and the firefighters were able to stay on their frontline equipment, like Chief Stidham was talking about, $1.3, $1.4 million on a new ladder. And then all of a sudden, they're sitting on a 15, 20-year-old apparatus because they got hit on the highway. They started seeing that benefit real quick. I mean, real quick. And they bought into it nearly immediately. I mean, just like when I rode out the tiller trucks here in Irving, most of the firefighters were like, we don't need a tiller truck in Irving. I sent my apparatus crew out to California. They came back. Now they're sold on it. So that's what I mean. They don't like things to say. In the program, and it and it shows itself to be beneficial. It's just a matter of time they buy into it. But yeah, we got pushback in Irving originally, but it didn't last long. I promise you. <laughs> well, I like that that they don't like things to change. Uh, and they don't like them to stay the stay the uh, stay the same. So you know, there's no challenge in just trying to figure out where that that little lane of the highway <laughs> is to get in. But uh, Chief Stidham in Dallas, what was the what was the experience there? So for us, like I said, it's it's an overtime opportunity for our folks right now. So the men and women out there love it. Uh, they love the opportunity to get on there and do it. But you know, even if it wasn't, like I said, we're trying to get some staff blockers and it's a, it's one of our top priorities uh, in the department right now. And the men and women out there lo absolutely love it when the blockers show up, because again, like we've mentioned over and over, you don't want your frontline piece of equipment getting hit. So, um, you know, the blocker itself, that's what it's there for. It's That's its intended purpose, keep them safe, keep that uh, other piece of equipment from getting hit. The driver gets out and goes, so it's they're not in a dangerous position. Uh, they go in and go up with the engine or truck crew. So, uh, but again, our the men and women out there of Dallas Fire Rescue love the program. They don't want it to go away. Uh, and we're gonna do our best to keep it as long as, I, as, long as we can, so. Scott, everybody in the colony happy with what 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 you're rolling out there, and uh, and uh, any any uh, any pitfalls or things to watch out for? Well, to answer your question, probably not on the, the first one, but no, I you know we're changing something every day, and change has just become become part of our our culture. So I, I don't see this; it's not in service yet, but we're putting them in an eighteen thousand square foot station and giving them all kinds of things. So I, I don't see it being a problem. We got past the paramedic only thing. So I think we'll be okay on this, but uh, we'll wait and see. I have hit very high expectations for that, that truck crew and, and how we, we paired them up with that quick response vehicle. So I think they're set up for success. I will, I will throw in here that I've had a lot of lower ranks contacting me to get the program implemented in their department as much or more so than fire chiefs around the country. They want to carry it to their chief and get it implemented. So I, I think even the firefighters are picking up on it that it's a beneficial program for, for them at the station. 
Yeah, they, you know what? That's a that's a great point because and 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 true in this department as well. I do have a lot of members that come in, or you know, they've heard that we're that we're and and to be honest with you. This is something, in my opinion, you know, we, we would have loved to have implemented this two years ago. Uh, our fleet, we were, we were on the tail end of the last two, our last two operating reserve engines. We normally have three reserve engines. Uh, they're all American La France. Uh, the last one needed $18,000 worth of repairs to it. And um, that was after spending about 12000 you know, six months prior to that. And we still couldn't even get it running. But so we're we're trying to get there as fast as we can to get something in this position. But I, I'm sitting over here thinking to myself because, you know, truly, and every one of you has said this five years ago. Well, the last American LaFrance that we tried to trade in on an engine, they wouldn't even take it. And we we traded it for like small tools. Uh, but you know that they don't bring anything at auction yet I, I talked to a guy that's that's up the road here in lake cities that's kind of turned a part-time business and in, into refurbing fire trucks and reselling used fire trucks but i'm sitting here thinking to myself this this almost is a is is another market for uh, used fire equipment uh and and i i don't necessarily know that that's out of the realm of possibility at some point because if you've got especially a, a, a you know the the size of y'all's fleets but you could obviously, you know, I guess what I wouldn't want to be in a position of having two blocker engines. I get two blocker engines that are totaled in the highway. So my next choice is to put, you know, well, we're out of those. So now we're going to put, you know, the, the 1.3 million thing back out there uh, and, and wait for that to happen. And so I'm sitting here thinking to myself, man, you know, for I want to go scour the used market and find one for five thousand dollars and put another five thousand into it. And I'm I'm as invested and as interested in keeping that fleet going as I am my primary fleet. You know your old uh, LaFrance tower ladder sitting on the side of the road between here and Austin for sale, don't you? The Louisville yeah. truck. I saw it the other day. Yeah, I saw it. <laughs> you can buy it. You can buy it back. Yeah, I know it. I know it. <laughs> I it right now. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, well, we're coming up on one o'clock. Uh, the show's an hour long, so and I, and I appreciate all of y'all's time. I know that uh, all of y'all are extremely busy on a on a normal day. I think Chief Conley, uh, uh, Chief Thompson said you were in some budget stuff, so I appreciate you making yeah, time. Absolutely, Chief Stim. I'm quite certain you're not short of things to do down there. Uh, <laughs> but I appreciate all that, but but before we go, I just want to give you guys the opportunity and, and kind of cycle through here. And any any last thoughts or ideas or uh, or words of wisdom for anybody who's thinking about this uh well, you, chief still why don't you go uh, go first yeah i would just say if anybody's thinking about it um you know reach out to us we'll be glad to help uh chief conley i know his group is willing to help anybody but this is this is a program that everybody needs in my opinion um i can't see us ever not having it now that we have it we've seen the benefit like i said we've already these things are, are too, just in the small areas they're running, they're averaging, uh, you know, over 250 calls a month, just in a small area. So you can imagine uh, the freeway time that they're out there. So uh, they're very beneficial. It's a very beneficial program. And, uh, you know, we're willing to help if anybody needs it. Perfect. Thank you for that. Uh, Chief Conley, any, uh, any parting words? Uh, in addition to what Chief Stidham just shared, um, I wanted to go back. You were talking about purchasing apparatus and all that, and I'm not sure how different people rotate their equipment, but, you know, you're talking about getting two new pieces of equipment. Here in Irving, we keep uh, the front line goes down. Of course, we move it in that program, and then from the backup, we roll the pumpers into a blocking program, and then we go to auction or we donate them to voluntary departments. So, that piece of equipment has found a niche within our rotation for all of our heavy apparatus. And so other than that, I said, just look at how you want to design the program, keep your equipment. And I think the four of us should take this show on the road. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, there's a little, uh, there's a little function next April. That, uh, okay. Certainly sign, you us, sign us up. <laughs> Chief, uh, Chief Thompson, what's your uh, parting word for us today? Well, the thing I'll add is, is don't, rule it out just because you're a small department. Um, you know, we're, we're three stations soon to be, soon to be five, but 
if there's, you know, if there's a well, there's a way. And I think it's that important. Um, we've made it part of our fleet replacement program. So we go so, so many years frontline, so many years reserve, so many years in blocking status, and then we, we'll sell to Louisville. But um, just, just, you know, work on it. Go visit these folks that have offered help, Dallas, Irving, and uh, find a way to make it work. There's always a thousand reasons you can come up with to not make it work. Sometimes we take the path of least resistance, but just because you're a small department doesn't mean you can't have the same level of protection for your people as the big departments. Well, you know, great point. And I, I, I say this frequently and, and it doesn't matter law enforcement or fire and, and you can work in a big city or small city, but <clears throat> the, the criminals don't care. The fire doesn't care. The, the, the people driving them down that highway don't differentiate. So uh, the need is there. Uh, and I think the, um, I think the, uh, the, the the program is is a valuable one, and, and and like you said, everybody should look at that. Chief Sidham, if somebody wanted to reach out to you and, and ask you a question, or maybe ask for some uh, some uh, help or information on this program, how could they get in touch with you? Uh, email would be the best way. It's r a n d a l l dot s p i d h a m at dallascityhall.com. All right. Thank you for that. And uh, Chief Conley, how could somebody get in touch with uh, somebody, you or somebody at Irving to help them out? I just just Google Irving Fire Department and you'll you'll come up with a city website and all of our information is listed on the fire department page. All right. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Scott, uh, I don't want to let you out of here. How's the book sales coming? Good, man. Good. Uh, exceeding my expectations. So everything's uh, everything's going well. Exceeding Please. your expectations so much so that you're starting uh, another book. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not not necessarily for that reason, but I am. It's therapy for me. Yeah, we're gonna do another. <laughs> All right. Well, it works good for me too, because after you get frustrated writing a book, then you'll call me and say, "Hey, I gotta." <laughs> <laughs> it's me. Um, so uh, anyway, Scott, how can somebody get a hold of you? Uh, go to the website or s Thompson at the Colony TX dot gov. All right. Again, thank uh, thank all three of you for uh, your time. I appreciate it. It was a good hour. Uh, I learned a lot, me personally. And, and uh, as we venture down this road, I'll certainly be leaning on the three of you uh, heavily as, as we get into this. And so uh, in closing, uh, we want to please keep uh, men and women serving in our armed forces in your thoughts and prayers. And remember, never forgetting means never forgetting. Thank you all and everyone be safe. Be safe. Bye bye.